Okay. So ready? Ready. All right. So the first question, and and you can speak as freely as you like. If you want to curse, if you want to, you know, say whatever. I'm okay. Open. Okay. So the first question is, when do you feel the most powerful? That's just in the general sense. Um, <clears throat> I mean, honestly, the most recent was when I was doing Chocolate Covered Rocky Horror. I played Brad and I played um, Eddie and Dr. Scott on different nights. So I played three roles technically, but it was split between like I had two responsibilities one night and then one responsibility the other night. Um, and just after like successfully completing that and also like getting the feedback from people, I had friends who came to the show, um, I was getting recognized. I was being like praised not that that's like a, like a need or anything, but it just felt nice. Um, because even during the show, like at one point I had done like a backwards somersault and I had been running around and I didn't run out of breath. And I was like, fuck, that feels so fucking good. Like I do have this in me Um, with like, I guess it is just like when, whenever there's some sort of recognition or acknowledgement, I just really love being acknowledged um whether it's a smile walking past a stranger whether it's um a partner being like wow you're so good at this whether it's a random audience member saying you're so good at this like any sort of that kind of like recognition and acknowledgement of the talent yeah yeah also have you always been involved in theater I have always been doing something artistic. It's not necessarily theater. Um, I started theater in eighth grade, um, but what got me into theater was doing things like ballet and I did orchestra and choir. So naturally in choir, you're gonna do musical theater numbers. And I wanted to learn more about those numbers. Um, My mom played The Sound of Music one Christmas when we were kids and I just like remember that was super special because it was like a four hour movie and I was up late you know and I was like ooh that's like a musical like I thought that was so scandalous but it was literally The Sound of Music you know um so it's it's always something that's been around my mom definitely got me into it she took me to like the Phantom of the Opera the Lion King local theater um and my brother kind of dabbled in it a little bit, but didn't really stick through with it. I'm the one that's stubborn. So I stuck through it in college, even though I wasn't studying it. I do it now. I did it after college, all that. So I just, it's just a fun thing, you know? Yeah. Awesome. I love that. I also did ballet when I was younger. It's such a good way to just learn how to exist with other people. I think, I think every child should take a dance or movement class. Oh, it's sure. like, I did ballet and I did, I did ballet for a year and then tap for a year. Nice. Yeah, but I was the only uh, boy in our company. Same. So, um, it limited our roles vastly. <laughs> so when we did Romeo and Juliet, I was Romeo. Of course. Um, and then of we course. did, I want to say we did the Nutcracker for tap. And I was like the Nutcracker. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I really wanted to be the Rat King. That was like my dream. <laughs> That's a good role. I love yeah. that role. It's good music. It's really good music. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about uh, the flip of that question and when you feel the least powerful. Um. Honestly, when I'm at work and I'm trying to show up professionally and I'm just not getting that recognition or that acknowledgement. And once again, returning to like that word praise, it's not that I need praise in order to like survive. Right. I just don't get any recognition, um, any acknowledgement of the hard work. It's always, well, you didn't do this. And so you don't get any recognition. Um, as someone who has very, very loudly and proudly been queer for like all my whole life, even before I actually did tell people that I was queer, um, it's very hard for me to exist in this space because I look at people like Billy Porter. And honestly, I look at people like you and I look at people like um, just anybody who exists in this world of like fashion is just like an ultimate expression. I get to play with it. I don't necessarily feel that I get that luxury because A, I would have to do it in front of my students and they're going to bully me, but that's not Mm. the biggest issue, you know? Um, 
the I would just teach them like, hey, it's just fashion, whatever. And maybe I could like really just kill it one day and I would actually impress them with that obscure fashion. But if I show up in heels to school, I would get a couple of side eyes from the other adults in the building is the thing that I'm the most upset about because I feel that I can teach a child. Obviously, that's what I that's what I went to school for. Um, but it's the teaching the adults, especially teaching the adults about myself and my identity um, that I really, really struggle with. So I just return to the ultimate cozy. I wear sweaters all the time in school, whether it's a hoodie, like I wear this one in school all the time, um, or just like a regular sweater. Um, I definitely just go with cozy blob aesthetic, even though what I kind of want to do is like that like that Miranda Priestly, everyone gets out of her way, you know, because she's just so on another level. And I see, again, like I see you doing that with your fashion. I see, um, oh, like Moses Sumney doing that with his fashion also. Um, I love fashion. I mean, what kind of got me into photography was reading my mom's Vogue magazines, honestly, like National Geographic also in Smithsonian, but like specifically those Vogue fashion shoots were so stunning because it was just color, it was texture, it was explosion, but it was all on a magazine paper, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's, again, like I'm turning 30 years old in February and I'm not going, and I'm still feeling like I'm hiding who I like actually want to be. I want to be that bold. Um, but the way that I do it instead of doing fashion is I just like, I'm very loud. <laughs> I speak yeah. up, you know, I yeah. see an injustice and I fully believe that queer is that, I mean, so many people say this, but queer is not just like gay. And I do a lot of work to remove myself from gay because I fully identify with queer as in, no, we are going to protest. Queer as in, no, we are speaking up. Queer as in, it doesn't fucking matter. Leave me the fuck alone. I'm fucking queer. Like that kind of pride um, element that n not caring at all sort of identity. Yeah, um, includes the community as a whole. Exactly. Exactly. And I do that with my teaching also, just allowing all of my students to exist. Like my wall says everyone is welcome for a reason because some kids just don't even get a welcome when they walk in the classroom. So if they can at least see it on the wall, even if I don't say it one day, um, they know that they're welcome in that space. And it says everyone for a reason. It doesn't matter which student it is. It's like, we have a wide variety of students. We have white redneck students. We have white rich students. We have black rich students. We have students who just got out of Pakistan because there was war and violence in their country and students who are leaving the Ukraine because they're refugees from the war with Russia. And I have students from Guatemala and Venezuela and Colombia. And it's just like trying to make sure that all of those students, whether they come from a home that's supportive or not supportive, at least they can have a space where they are supported, even if it's for like an hour. Right. Um, and yeah, that's very impactful. Especially yeah what, what grade are we seventh grade this year but middle grade is like where my passion is that sixth seventh eighth grade because not many people can stomach that <laughs> oh trust me i taught art and for seventh graders mm -hmm. did it for one year and i was like hands washed cannot will not it's yeah. i mean that's when they really are becoming people outside yeah. of like you know you know, elementary school, they're, they're really children and they're really like so moldable. Um, yeah. in high school, they're kind of have a sense of self. They have a more sense of identity and they, they're kind of there. They almost, it's like they recognize it as a job at that point. They're there to do the work and so they can get out of there. But middle school is this weird middle ground where they're like just flooded with ideas they're starting to smell like it's so many things going on and smell they do <laughs> yeah i mean and they're, they're discovering sex and all this other kind of stuff yeah. i remember there was a very vivid moment where i was in the hallway it was just me one other teacher and the kids were like um going some of them were like loading up for buses for dismissal and then the other kids were like kind of hanging out because they were doing like an after school thing and we were standing there we overheard this group of maybe 10 boys all of them discussing like an escape plan where they were going to get on this other bus that they're not supposed to ride and go to this one girl's house the girl doesn't even go to the school oh my god so from another school oh my god everyone has been discussing because she's very active sexually 
And so they're all planning how they're going to go over to her house. They're going to, you know, take turns, whatever. And so we're standing there. We both are in earshot. So she hears it and I hear it. And so after, after they disperse, she goes, well, you need to say something to them. And I was like, why me? <laughs> I'm like, we both heard it. And she was like, but yep. that was like they coming from you. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know if that's true. Yeah. Um, and then when I did end up eventually saying something to them, I just kind of was like, because I, I figured it wouldn't make sense for me to tell them not to do it. Uh, so what I did was just like, <laughs> if you are going to do this thing, I'm not saying you are. I'm just saying like, if you do, make sure you're protecting yourself. Make sure you're in a safe space. You know, I I can't tell you what to do, what not to do, but I'm pretty sure Rachel's parents won't want y'all there, especially a group of 10 of you. <laughs> That's kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but, you know, it just was a way of wording it. But I was like, after that, I was like, seventh grade is not for the week. And people are like, that stuff doesn't happen in middle school. And I'm like, I assure you oh, it happens it's in exactly middle school. where it starts. That's, That's like exactly the, where it starts. The brewing point of those kinds of things. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. <laughs> how, um, you know, how you would like to show up. Are there spaces that you are aware of where you can show up like that? Um, Not necessarily spaces, but there are people that allow that space in the same way that I allow that space for my students. Um, there is a lot of connection and community and um, it's very privatized, unfortunately. It almost feels like early repression of queer identity. You know, I grew up in Howard County, Maryland, very, very rural um, <laughs> farms all around my house. So I, I mean, I worked on a pick your own fruit farm mm -hmm. and I just was like, I'm not like these other people right now. Um, I need to find my community. So that's how I picked a lot of my friends growing up. Um, and that's what I did at this school too, because I, it was just very quickly, very apparent that I wasn't going to get that acknowledgement or that recognition for my hard work. And uh, it didn't mean that I was bad at what I was doing. It's just that you can't please everybody. Um, I've learned that very early on. And unfortunately, some people are just not going to like you. Um, it's always been weird to me to be like hated by someone who's like in their 30s or 40s. Um, I thought we were all adults here, but I guess not. Um, so that's the way that I kind of, I look at it and I just, I'd have to not pay them any mind just because it started affecting me so badly. Um, I just was showing up later. I was still showing up on time, but I wasn't coming in at 7.30. I was coming in right when I was supposed to come in. Like I had to be there by that point. Um, waking up with fevers and nausea and just being like, I don't feel well enough to even go to school today. Um, just like I was noticing that that was changing um, because I was so focused on those people that like were not allowing me the space to be as big as I like to be. Um, and focusing more on like, oh, well, this teacher, I know I can trust this teacher. I know I can work with this teacher, things like that. So, yeah. Do you feel like some of that, um, what feels like, you know, hatred or, or kind of like aversion to you, do you think that maybe it's uh, like reverse of them seeing or reverse of them feeling the oppression of themselves and that you represent like a, a beacon of something they maybe aspire to be or thought that they could be at one time? I don't know if it's about for themselves personally. I really like that question, but I think that they do recognize, um, to use your word, like my beacon um, represent my beacon status I guess quote unquote um because again like I will speak up I will speak up for my students I'm like well why did you suspend this student for this and not suspend this student for this it's very apparent what's <laughs> what's going on here let's just use the words I recognize it you know you recognize it you're just being very official about it or whatever and hiding it so that way you can be tricky it's like that scene in the barbie movie where it's like well you're not doing patriarchy very well and he's like i assure you we're doing it well we just have to hide it now it's like it's very apparent what the what they are doing um 
And it it scares people to especially see adults be beacons, especially with children. It scares people, I think, to see adults who can relate to children. Um, we actually had an incident with our school where that was a more serious issue. So I can understand why somebody might be confused that I'm able to relate with younger audiences. Um, I've been watching kids movies my whole life. I never stopped. I've been reading young adult novels my whole life. I never stopped. Um, <clears throat> working with kids my whole life, I never stopped. Even when I was a kid, I was working with kids. Um, it's just always been that sort of, I really like being that lighthouse. I really like being that teacher. I really like being that guiding light um, for the future generation or just for children in general. Um, so I don't want to say anything that's like accusing them of thinking incorrectly of me, but from the behaviors that were exhibited at the school from another queer teacher, I can understand where their reservations came from. Um, also just being in the county, in the area, I know exactly the demographic of the folks that are living there. And I know the, the, the cultural upbringings of some of the people who are very um, secretive about their homophobia. Because for me, I when I made my discrimination complaint, actually, I had to file one um, because of the treatment. I They were like, do you think that this is because you are queer? And I'm like, yeah, I absolutely do. And though they've never called me a slur like the students have, or they've never outright said that I'm not good as a teacher because I'm gay, I believe that their actions or inaction spoke way louder than any of the words that they could have thrown at me because I was very much facing homophobic bullying that they just did not respond to because it wasn't on their radar or it wasn't on their priority. It wasn't a problem for them. Right. Um, they were more worried about, well, why are half of your students failing in this class and in the other class, the the achievement is so high and I'm like well you're relating this to a GT class over here you oh. know my students are reading at a fourth grade level half of them are now reading at a sixth grade level let's talk about that right. but they're like well they're still not reading at an eighth grade like so it was just the consistent barrage of well I'll never be good enough for them um yeah. And bringing up the concerns about the bullying and the harassment, that's when I noticed that like the developing ratings started coming out. That was when the professionalism concerns started coming out. That was when the, hey, don't wear sandals started coming out. I'm like, tell the women not to wear sandals. Yeah. Fight. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, and then, yeah. education is such a, it's in a weary state currently, because I mean, we're missing out on so much of, um, you know, before in the earlier times and I, I'm 35 so I say earlier times like you know when I was younger and in school so much of school's impact really was like what happened in the home you know what I mean so yeah. I know I, I had parents who were very strict about homework like even if we didn't have homework or like had something to do when we come home there was something that they gave us to do so that we weren't just mm -hmm. like home vegging out or watch the tv the whole day or whatever you know what i mean mm -hmm. so and i know that's not something that translates into a lot of homes today or um i think that also people rely heavily on educators now to do the bulk of teaching kids just any and everything so you know you're get you're being a teacher but you also have to teach kids about hygiene and, and things like that where it's like i don't have time to teach that and world history you know what yeah. i mean I don't have time to make your kid a good person as well as make sure they know the three branches of the government. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So it's, I, my head goes off to you because it, it's, I know it's tough to do that. And that's the thing that like I keep returning to is because I know so many people who are just flat out leaving the field after one year, after two year. Um, and that's like, that's totally okay. I completely understand. But if the issues are, if the issues were what people think that they were, I would have been gone that first year too. This is year three for me. So I know exactly what the issues are. I know exactly who's at fault. I think I know exactly what's going on. I don't have any cold 
concrete hard proof of what's going on but i have assumptions and intuition because i've experienced it my whole life um and that's why i'm just like i'm not trying to change the career field because i know that's what i want to be doing is education i i knew in eighth grade i was going to be be a language arts teacher because it was my eighth grade language arts teacher that made me want to be a teacher and made me feel safe in the classroom for the first time um you want to talk about them i mean she just was like the most incredible educator just absolutely intuitive on children emotion and regulation needs which was something that i did not have a lot of as a kid um i was the combative angry child i was the mean child like um selma blair has a memoir called mean baby and it's because her mom always called her a mean girl and it was like that's what my mom always did but i again was not getting acknowledged or recognized for like the things that I was doing well. Well, how about how I share with people or how about how I was fucking adopted from another country and I'm not even a member of my family. I don't feel like I relate to them, but I'm still overcoming that and I'm still blah, blah, like whatever. Um, It's just, I always hate it when people focus on the things that like you can't change in 20 seconds. Why are you bringing it up? You know? Um, And she, I mean, she... I don't know if she was Russian, but just like completely unbeknownst to her, shared a story and like shared Russian culture with us. Um, she brought in borscht. She shared folk tales and fairy tales. Um, so it was just something where I was like, oh, she got to know her students and like brought in elements of her students into the classroom so that way they could learn. Um, that's one of the things that I try to do. My kids don't understand Robert Frost, but they can understand Audre Lord. They can understand Tupac. <laughs> that was one of the things I was writing about in my email is just like they they are struggling to relate to the work that they are being told to do. And I don't blame them. Mm-hmm. I didn't even relate to the work that I was told to relate to. It was few and far between where I actually read a book in class and was like, I love this book. Mm-hmm. Half the time, I just didn't read them, even you though know, wait, I, they're probably out of. 10 books over the course of my school complete, you know, curriculum. I think I might've read three. Yeah. And those yeah, was, also had movies. So I saw yeah. the movies and there were Yep. Three. Yep. But I always read other books. I always showed up to class with the books I was interested in. I was reading Crime and Punishment in eighth grade. And my teacher was like, what are you doing reading Dostoevsky? And I was like, I don't know. He's Russian. I like Russia stuff right now. Mm-hmm. And he's like fixated on Russia. So, um, and she was never like, well, you're weird. Put that away. You're like, a, she was like, that's amazing. But like, make sure you return to it in the future because you probably don't under blah, blah, blah. Like not saying you're too stupid to read that saying, don't forget to return to it because that's what we do with text. Like teaching life lessons at the same time as teaching like how to read, you know? Um, <clears throat> yeah, she's just, she was very formative I mean I remember a lot of my teachers obviously I because I'm in teaching I am friends with a lot of teachers on my Facebook but she just was the one that like I remember most of the classes whereas other teachers I'm like I, that teacher was so good because there was this one class yeah. but with her I'm like there were these 18 classes that just really made it for me you know so what would be a, a dream scenario for you as far as like a space where you can show up 100% yourself, do the thing you love. Like, what does that look like? Just a space where I'm trusted, you know? Um, I think a lot of it comes down to trust or a lack of. Um, um, A space of connection again not being friends with everybody because you don't have to be friends with everybody but I don't like the side eye glances (laughs) I don't like the I don't like the hearing from another teacher that someone was talking about me I don't like the like the I don't know I feel like I'm walking around on eggshells but people still have complaints you know it's just I'm guarding every move um I don't do well when I feel guarded or like I'm not being fully myself. Um, And that's not to say like, I'm going to show up in ball gowns every day, but like, I would love to feel comfortable to just wear a skirt to school. 
mm-hmm. um, with a cute sweater because fuck, that's fucking cute. <laughs> um, um, I don't need to lead a school. I don't need to make a principal salary. It would be nice, but I'm one of those people who I'm not in teaching for the salary. I'm in it for the kid's future and my future because these are the guys that are going to take care of me when I'm too old to take care of them. You know, it's like, I, we need to build a better world for ourselves. And one of the best ways to do it is take care of the kids. That's been a long time thing. Um, So again, like, I don't need to be the principal of a school where then people will respect me. I just want to be recognized as the teacher that I am and also feel comfortable to be the teacher that I am. I love that. Yeah. Hold on one second. It's uh, letting me know we're running out of time. Oh, no. Uh, so, outside of teaching, sorry. Please don't okay. okay. So, outside of the teaching aspect, can you hear that? I can, but don't worry about it. It happens to me all the time. I'll be in the middle of teaching and I'll hear an email and the kids freak out. And it's just like, I I tune it out. It's like people who have the smoke alarm in their house going off. Oh, yeah, little B. They, they literally tune it out with their brain just because it's been going off for so long. But I, I mean, mine doesn't go off because that's a safety concern for me, but. Yeah, yeah. We're, yeah. Um, our smoke detectors here in my building are too sensitive. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. It's crazy. But um, if you could, and this is like uh, kind of like one of the final questions, if you could think of a, like, a way to move yourself outside of those arrested feelings, what would kind of be a process that you can think of or something that you may have applied in the past to help you get to a space where at least you can do your work or you can feel comfortable enough to be as close to yourself as you can? Getting the law involved. (laughs) Okay. I I hate to be that blunt about it, but in like a more artistic answer, I guess, Um, One of the things that I constantly hear from people is, wow, you are so resilient. And I'm like, I'm so fucking tired of being resilient. I just want to be because I'm constantly feeling like I'm guarded, like I'm walking on eggshells. And that does come with the resiliency because I recognize, "Uh oh, this person doesn't like me. I got to be smart about this. And that's like how my resiliency shows up. Um, I've lost jobs. I've for like budget cut reasons and I just have to look past it it's like no hard feelings I get it it's a nonprofit theater company you don't have the money but like why the fuck did you choose me and I could have spent a month crying about it I could have spent a month bitching about it and coming up with reasons why they didn't like me and posting about it publicly but no what I did was I went and applied to jobs I went out and walked into places I said here's my resume you know like just um getting like getting past it getting through it keeping keeping on um regardless of whatever the circumstances might be um also just returning again to like what my original loves are is just the art world in general um i'm not really a painter but i love paintings i love artwork i love going to the museums and just putting in my headphones and not and just getting like lost in the museum um I one time just drove to the Grand Canyon um from Baltimore because I've lived here my whole life I just was like I'm gonna take a week off of work because I can't really do this anymore and then I drove to the Grand Canyon and I drove back (laughs) it was like always wanted to see the Grand Canyon um so it's a lot of that like quite literally getting away from it all um, because it really does feel too much. It really does feel suffocating, Um, like emotionally claustrophobic rather than physically claustrophobic. So just going to New York and seeing theater, um, going to the Grand Canyon or a state park and hiking, going to a museum that's right down the road, um, watching Bridge to Terabithia and just making myself cry because I'm so stressed, like giving myself that forced catharsis of letting it out, you know? Um, a, a lot of things that, but that just kind of like resets me back to a, what's the word? Is it homeostasis where it's just like you're standing like an even playing? Yeah. Like, like that level. Um, 
Because really when I am at like that flat, flat line level, that's when I'm like, fuck yeah, I did drive to the Grand Canyon. And then people <laughs> ask me about that. And they're like, that's so cool. Like, how do you do that? Like, um, so just like kind of forcing myself to be cool again, even though I really don't feel like it. Cause that drive to the Grand Canyon, I was crying halfway through Oklahoma. I was crying halfway through Texas. I was crying all the way through Tennessee on the drive back home. Cause I didn't want to be going back home. Like it just, there was a lot of emotion that I was just like holding on to that, that really just let me release so that I could get back to that. Like, all right, my emotions are like in a space yeah Good. well thank you so much for sharing course, really yeah. you speaking so freely and being so open with me it's gonna make for a beautiful garment thanks for having me i'm so excited <laughs> no problem yeah i'm excited to put this together um and i have to tell you this is probably one of the better interviews that i've had today so thank oh, you thank you um, and I'll keep you posted on everything as it's developing. Like I said, I'll go into actual like production at the end of this week. Um, of course. So uh, I'll be able to show everybody everything as it's developing. Cool. Cool. Well, hey, I'm not working right now. I'm on a mental health break. So if I can make it down to Miami, I might just drive on down there. Who knows? I'll so. do, um, the because right now we're actually I'm working with uh, I hate calling him like my handler, but like the guy who's doing all my planning for everything down there. Yeah. Um. So we actually had a meeting Sunday, and we're solidifying like everything. So as soon as I know like the ins and outs of like when I'll be able to like have time or what events I'll be at for sure, um, and lock everything in, I'll let you know. Cool. Sounds good. Thanks so much. It's always a pleasure to work with you. Yeah, man. I'll talk to you soon. I'll talk to you soon. Have a good night.